The following program was paid for by the friends and partners of Kyle Winkler Ministries. God is so good that he will send his Holy Spirit to put the pressure on those prison doors. And when you finally get to the point where I just can't stand this anymore and you blurt out the confession, then a peace comes that God wanted you to have from the get go. Well, living a shame-free life is often a process of many stages. It's not an overnight process. Mine didn't happen overnight for sure, but it was really many years of dealing with layer upon layer upon layer. I didn't have what I'm trying to give you here as a step-by-step shame-free living series, but really mine was working with the Holy Spirit, building foundation upon foundation upon foundation. And I think often that's just what God does with people that he's called to be teachers or people that he's called to help other people through things is that we don't get the shortcuts. Usually we have to take the long scenic routes of learning how to walk through this stuff and walk out this stuff so that we can later have the compassion, the empathy for people who are dealing with similar situations to help them walk it out and come into the breakthrough for their lives as well. So I'm not saying that this process has to be years for you, okay? I pray that it isn't. But also, there is no timetable here, okay? So don't put more shame on yourself, feeling like you're wrong because you haven't gotten to some sort of level of feeling that you have set for yourself, okay? And this is why I have been going through this series in a very structured way. You had to understand the foundation of God taking your old identity of sinner, of shame upon himself, crucifying it, and him giving you Jesus's identity of rightness and learning how to walk this out so that you could get to this next step that we're talking about today, which is the hardest one to do, but it's also the most freeing, and that's letting someone in on your story. And now you all are looking really afraid. (laughs) But that's why I had to build this up here because if you're not at the point of understanding that you are right with God, that you have been made right, then you're never gonna get to the point of being able to share your story with somebody else. You have to understand your identity in Christ, the new nature that you have, so that you're not as fearful about what is somebody gonna think if they find out about the things that I've been through or the things that I'm struggling with. And this is the process that the Bible really outlines. In Ephesians 4, 24, the verse we looked at last time, it says, put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. So this is about your new identity, your new nature, your rightness in Christ. But once you get that down, the next verse, verse 25, tells us what to do. And this is hard hitting, okay? So buckle up your seatbelts, all right? This is a tough one to do. But it says, so stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. Now, stop telling lies has various applications, I think, beyond just the obvious, beyond just not telling a lie or a fib to your neighbor about what you did last week or about your business dealings or, you know, some kind of personal relationship thing or whatever, you know, just kind of the casual things that we sometimes tell little white lies, right, (laughs) about. But I think in this context that it's actually talking about revealing yourself to people, about taking off the mask, about not pretending anymore, letting your neighbors in on what you're dealing with and what you have dealt with. And just to give the disclaimer right up front here, I'm not talking about telling the world. I'm not talking about this becoming your public platform. It says neighbors here, okay? Not the world, it says neighbors. And so those are the people that are close to you. Those are the people that are a part of your life that have been in your lives for a while. So you can rest easily here. But some people say, well, why do I have to tell anybody in the first place? Can't I just confess to God? Isn't that enough? Well, yeah, in part that is. You have to get to the point of getting this stuff out of you and to God, yes, But God's not surprised anyway, okay? It's not that God doesn't know this stuff. Like I said a couple weeks ago, when I vocalized some things to God, he said, Kyle, you are no surprise to me. (laughs) 
I knew all of that stuff anyway, yet I still called you, yet I still chose you, yet I still want to use you, okay? So your confessing it to God, getting it out of you, is to get you spiritually at peace. And that is step one. Your rightness with God. But there is a whole new level of freedom and peace to be had in your life if you can get to the point of letting somebody else in on the secrets. Because really, so much about the identity complexes that we have is that how we view ourselves is often based upon what we believe other people view us as. This is why we're so afraid to let people know about things. Because, oh no, if they know, maybe it's gonna skew their view of me. Or maybe it's gonna confirm to me what I have feared about myself for so long. Maybe it's gonna confirm that I am just damaged goods. Maybe it is gonna confirm that I am just one big, bad, messed up, wrong person. And these are the lies that the enemy will plant in your mind to keep you back from this freeing process. All the what ifs and how are they gonna react and what are they gonna say and are they gonna love me, are they gonna reject me? But you know, in every situation of this that I've seen, every situation where I've seen somebody be open to a person that God led them to, a trusted someone, it's actually confirmed the opposite for them. It's confirmed that they are loved despite the things about them that they feel were unlovable. You know, David, King David, he knew something about shame. He knew something about the symptoms of shame. He knew something about the freedom and the healing that comes from confession. In 2 Samuel 11, it kind of records the story of when kings were typically out at war, David stayed back. You know, when you stay back from something that you should be doing, idle hands are the devil's handiwork. You get yourself in a whole lot of trouble that way. And David got himself in a whole lot of trouble. He got lusting after another man's wife, Bathsheba. And then just to kind of breeze over some details, he ends up getting her pregnant. Okay, so there are a lot of things that he could have felt shame about over there. Okay, first, he wasn't doing his responsibility. That can cause shame for people. Second of all, he was lusting over somebody. That can cause shame for people. Then he gets her pregnant. Okay, that causes shame for people. But then to add insult to injury here, <laughs> he concocts a plan to hide his shame and to hide his secrets by planning to kill Bathsheba's husband. Now, I don't know when David ever thought that that would be a good idea. <laughs> but we can't give too much judgment. I mean, I hope that we're not concocting plans to kill anybody, all right? But... <laughs> We do concoct plans all the time that are just stupid and goofy kind of things to try to hide our secrets and our shame and try to hide our lies in the moment. <laughs> but it never works out, does it? Because we always get found out. You know, the Bible does say that your sin will find you out. Okay, it always comes to light. I have learned this with even some of the most casual things in my life. I mean, I've just realized I might as well just be upfront with people in the get-go and not, you know, try to tell any kind of stories because inevitably somebody ends up finding I was here or I was there or, you know, whatever. I wasn't hanging out with them when I told these people I'd be over here. And it just ends up being a mess. And it's this complex web of things that you have to sort through. Because especially if you're a, a person of God, <laughs> if you're a Christian, I mean, you're just definitely getting boxed in because God wants to bring this stuff out. He does not want you to harbor these kind of secrets and I don't think it's to cause you humiliation. I don't think it's just to cause you pain, but I think it's really often to save you. God doesn't want you harboring all this stuff that's like a poison on the inside of you. Maybe you've heard it said before, but you're only as sick as your secrets. And David learned this in Psalm 32.3. He writes about what was happening to him whenever he was keeping these secrets on the inside of him. Here's what he says, look at this. He says, when I kept silence, when I kept these secrets, this shame on the inside of me basically, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. His secrets made him sick emotionally, physically, and spiritually. But you know, God confirms his word with signs following. That's what the Bible says. That's why science is always slowly catching up to what God's word has only said all along. But researchers now say that people who harbor secrets 
when you do this, it actually senses a surge of stress hormones that make you sick. It causes gastrointestinal problems, causes memory loss, heart disease, high blood pressure, all kinds of just horrible things. And the reason they say it is because your brain subconsciously spends so much energy trying to hold in the secret, trying to keep people from knowing that that energy otherwise could be spent on keeping your body healthy. But spiritually, so much of the torment that we receive from the enemy is the secrets that we hold in us, the shame that we hold in us, that the devil holds over our head, putting fear on us if somebody knows. And it's the source of our accusations and condemnation and the disqualifications that he puts in us. God does not want us to live with physical ailments or spiritual torment, which is why he works to bring this stuff out of us. And so getting back to David's story in 2 Samuel 12, David gets confronted by the prophet Nathan. Now David had no other choice here at this point but to confess because Nathan came with a word of knowledge from the Lord and David, you know, he couldn't hide it. Nathan knew, God knew, so he had to admit to it. But David didn't go grieving over being humiliated after that. He said, oh, I had to confess. No, actually David celebrated that it brought him to confession. And that Psalm that we looked at Psalm 32, where David was saying, my body was wasting away from my secrets. He actually then talks about how what joy it is for those who live their lives honestly. And he says, when I confessed, my guilt was gone. So just to share from my life, kind of how this works out, I think for a lot of us today, you know, I don't think that somebody has to come and confront you, but we are always being confronted by the person of the Holy Spirit. And he's more present than any other person can be. So I really experienced this when there were things in my life, just things that you've heard me talk about, about things people said about me, things that that put into me, just humiliating things to me. Maybe other people it wouldn't be so much, but they were to me. And so I had just vowed that I was never going to let anybody in on this stuff. I was gonna take this stuff to the grave. The problem is, is when you vow to take something to the grave for the reasons that I just mentioned, the grave actually comes faster. And so I started having this pressure that was mounting up on the inside of me. And by this point, I knew my identity in Christ. I knew my rightness with God, but the pressure was still mounting. And finally, God said to me, he said, Kyle, I have put people in your life that I want you to reveal your story to. (sighs) Okay, all right, God. (laughs) And just to make a long story short, I got a new freedom and a new peace in my life when I finally went to a few trusted people and I filleted myself and I said, okay, here is my story. Here are the things that I've been through. Here are the things that people have said about me. Here are the wounds that that had given me. Here are the struggles that I had. Here are the things that I feel. Here are the fears that I have because of it all. Take me or leave me, but this is me. And thankfully, in my situations, the people took me. (laughs) But when I finally formed my lips to get some of this stuff out of me, it gave me new levels of freedom, new levels of peace, new levels of healing that I never had before. So let's look at confession here. What is confession? You know, the Bible says that we are to confess to our neighbors. James 5, 16 here. I think it's the most popular. It's a theme for the rest of this message here. We're going to really unpack it, but it says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. That word confession there is the Greek word exolomageo. And it means the obvious to say and to speak and to share, but there's kind of a nuance with this word, which I love, which means to blurt out. And blurt means to say something without careful consideration. I think that's exactly what confession has to come to. It's not that you don't carefully consider, are you going to tell people? I think human nature is we mull that kind of stuff over in our minds for so long. But when you get to the point where you're like, okay, I'm gonna do this. In order to follow through with it, you have to abandon your careful consideration of what are they gonna think, how are they gonna react, all the worst case scenarios, and you have to get to the ledge and you finally have to blurt it out. And the best way that I can think of this is when I went skydiving at the end of my high school years. And there we were, we got up to like 12,000 feet in the air. 
and I'm looking down at the ground and I am thinking, when did I ever think that this was a good idea? <laughs> to jump out of a perfectly good airplane. And I was doing tandem, so somebody was attached to me, and you're literally inching your way to the edge of the airplane, to the door. <laughs> and you get to the door, and at that point, if you're going to do it, you have to have reckless abandon. You have to abandon all your fears. And in an instant, you just have to jump. And I'm telling you, the moment that you jump, and I have confirmed this with other people who've done the same thing, the moment that you jump, all of that fear is just suddenly gone. <laughs> because you're out there. I mean, it's like, ready or not, here I come. There's nothing you can do about it anyway, but you're out there and there's a peace that comes when you finally get to the ledge and you take the leap. And that's what happens with confession. When you finally get there and you're finally ready to abandon the care of what other people think because you know you are right with God, you know he has made you right, then you can just blurt it out. And when you do, just as that verse says there, healing starts to come. And so for the rest of this message, I wanna talk about the different ways that sharing your story heals you, the positive things that it will give you for your life. And I know looking at the time that we're not gonna get through all of the five ways that I have here, so we're gonna continue this message next time. And we're gonna go into more detail. I don't wanna breeze through all of this stuff because it's so important. But the first way that confession heals you is that it brings you peace. Somebody once said, and I love this quote, that there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story on the inside of you. And that is so true. Because as I mentioned from my story, a pressure mounts. Over time, a pressure mounts when you're harboring the shame and you're harboring these kind of secrets. And I think often, we think that pressure is spiritual warfare and this is the devil and we fight and we fight and we fight and we bind and we loose and we cast out all this pressure, but it doesn't go and it's not working. That's because you can't cast out the Holy Spirit because often it's the Holy Spirit putting the pressure on you because if you will not open the prison doors for yourself, God is so good that he will send his Holy Spirit to put the pressure on those prison doors to break those doors open for you. And when you finally get to the point where I just can't stand this anymore and you blurt out the confession, then a peace comes that God wanted you to have from the get-go. And it also neutralizes the enemy's weapons in your life. Because the things that he was holding over your head, the greatest fear of somebody knowing your secrets is now gone because you've shared it. And so I think it's just one of the ways that we take what the enemy meant for our defeat to defeat the devil instead. In Ephesians 5, Paul talks about the filthiness of some of the things that cause shame. He even says that there are things that we shouldn't even speak about, that people do in secret. But in verses 13 through 14, he talks about what happens when you finally get this stuff that you've kept in the darkness out of you. And it's really fascinating, look at this, it says, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For everything that becomes visible is light. And the best way that I can describe what Paul is talking about and meaning here is, remember when you were a kid and you turned the lights off in your bedroom to go to sleep and it was like suddenly all the shadows became huge monsters and they filled you with fear. But then the light would get switched back on and the fear would go away because you'd realize those were shadows of a toy that was in the corner of your room or something. There's nothing really to be afraid of. Well, when we keep things in us, we keep those things in the darkness. The devil uses those little things sometimes to create huge projections of monsters to fill you up and shrink you with fear. But when you finally expose those things to the light by letting a trusted someone in on your story, then that thing gets revealed for what it is, which often isn't that big of a deal anyway, and really had no business causing you all that kind of a fear. It was just a little toy in the corner that the devil used to create a monster in your mind out of. 
That's why it's said that sunlight is the best disinfectant. When you finally get things out, it takes the power out of it. It like puts a crucifying nail through the power of shame. And so really then, as you get comfortable, you'll share more and more maybe with more people. You don't have to. But just as I'm doing here, as I've gotten comfortable talking about some of this stuff that I wouldn't have talked about years ago, it brings more and more shame busting in my life and it brings more and more peace because it's out there. Nothing more for the devil to hold over your head. But another way that I think confession heals us and brings us peace really is that it brings you the feeling of real love maybe for the first time. So much of shame's torment, it's just as I've been saying that if people know this about me, then maybe they won't love me. Maybe they'll just reject me. And so people that live in shame really live for their whole life up to the point that they decide to do something about it, to share this stuff, never really feeling real love. Yeah, they might have people in their life, they probably do, that say that they love them, but that person living in shame will minimize those people's love because they'll say, oh, if they knew the truth about me, they wouldn't really love me. They only love me because of the facade that I've put on. But when you finally share your deepest secrets, and I'm not talking about every detail here, okay? Uh, You do not need to go into every detail, everything that you've ever done. Okay, that's not good for you and it's not good for other people. But the roots, what's the identity in you that you feared? (laughs) Those kinds of things, when you finally share that and reveal that with somebody and you're met with compassion and love, well, I am telling you that that is a healing power that no medicine can produce. When you finally realize, wow, they know the worst things about me and they still love me. It's been said that the four most powerful words in the English language are, I love you anyway. And I think that's so true. You know, we all have things about us that we think if somebody knows this about us, then they'll reject us. But that's only holding us back from a healing that comes when somebody chooses to love you, despite the things that you believe are unlovable, about you. When you finally take those layers down, you take those walls down and you let love penetrate into your core. This might be a poor example, I don't know, but think about an onion. If you cut an onion open, in the middle of the onion is called the heart of the onion and actually if you Google some of these images, you'll actually see some of them actually look like a heart. But that's the core of the onion and around that core is sometimes very thick layers. Well, at our core is our heart representing everything about us. And many of us have very wounded cores, and so we have built these walls that I've been talking about, these layers around us, to try to protect our wounded core, but the problem is, is it never gets healed, it just stays wounded, it just stays bleeding, as long as we keep these walls up. So you can put all kinds of healing salves around the outer layer of that onion, but it's never gonna be able to penetrate into the heart, and you can do all kinds of things try to apply to to mass symptoms to your outer layers of the walls that you've put up, but it's never going to get to the core of you. The love of other people is never gonna get to the core of you as long as you keep up those walls. So eventually what you have to do is you have to take the layers. You have to expose them to the sunlight. You have to expose who you are, expose those wounds, let people in so you can finally feel real love penetrate in to the core of you and let that heal you because it will. It'll heal you like you can never imagine, like you've never experienced before. Now we've only got through two of these and there are three more to get through and I also wanna share some cautions. I wanna tell you how to select people to share with and how to just get started. And so this is a big message I didn't wanna breeze through. So we're gonna continue next time looking at all that stuff. But maybe it's kind of bubbling up on the inside of you that, okay, I'm thinking maybe I wanna share some things with people. Well, just wait till you hear the last message, okay? Wait till we get through that. But for now, what I want you to do between now and then is just pray and reflect on what we talked about. You're only as sick as your secrets. God does not want you physically sick, spiritually tormented. 
doesn't want the devil having things to hold over your head, but he wants you to get to the point of knowing you are right so that you can be able to share with somebody else and experience the peace and the real love that comes from letting someone in on your story. Let's pray. Do you struggle with forgiving yourselves of old mistakes? Do you battle with something past or present that makes you feel unlovable, undesirable, or even unusable by God? These are the symptoms of shame. In a culture saturated with so much junk, it's no surprise that shame is at an all-time high, and it's being effectively used by the enemy to silence and destroy God's people. I know these effects firsthand because for too long, shame defined my life. But thankfully, I also know freedom from it. To help you experience this freedom, we're offering two shame-busting resources. The first is my Who I Am in Christ Miraclings. A crucial step to overcome negative labels and wrong thinking is to renew your mind according to what God says about you. These Miraclings are powerful at helping you do just that. Attractively designed with six big, bold declarations and scriptures, these cling to any mirror or solid surface providing constant reminders of the truths of your identity in Christ. I want you to have these so much that we're offering them to you for a donation of any amount. So don't wait. Go online now to kylewinkler.org slash clings and secure a two-pack of these Who I Am in Christ mirror clings today. It's also crucial that you learn the steps to freedom from shame. And that's what I lead you through in my new four-part series, Shame Busters. In four shame-busting messages, I explore the single place where shame is eradicated, how to transform your thinking to see yourself as someone who is right instead of wrong, the ultimate step to complete freedom and healing, and so much more. Get my four-part Shame Buster series on CD or MP3 for a donation of only $25. Shipping and handling is included. Simply go online now to kylewinkler.org to get this powerful series. And while you're there, don't forget to take advantage of our offer to get these Who I Am in Christ Miraclings for a donation of any amount. You may get them separately or with the Shame Busters four-part series at kylewinkler.org. Jesus took your wrongness so that you could have his rightness. And I want to show you how to experience that forever. So go online to kylewinkler.org to take advantage of these special offers today. I opened up the Shut Up Devil app many times a few months ago when I was going through severe cancer. Kyle's ministry has spoke life into me at a time where I almost quit believing in myself. Kyle's ministry does a fantastic job encouraging you midweek. And I really started to understand that God had a plan and He had a purpose directly for me. For us in our lives, when I finally took off the facade of a perfect person, <laughs> and I finally started to share some things, compassion rose up in me so that when I pray, when I preach, if I kind of counsel with somebody one-on-one, I end up seeing myself in them, but more so, they end up seeing themselves in me. 